Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Roland Xenology Pro tutorial series. Today we're going to be having a look at the pitch envelope, this uh, section down here. Just before we embark, if I can point you at the Patreon link in the description below uh, or the YouTube channel member button, uh, there are some ways to help support me and my content, help me carry on making, this, uh, making these videos. Okay, first thing to note about the pitch envelope. Oh, by the way, in the last episode, we were playing with the amp uh, envelope. I'm gonna leave that as is now, but I've made sure that I've got no attack on my notes. So it's a nice crisp sound. And we're gonna have a look at the pitch envelope today. And the first thing that I really wanted to point out is that we've got like three points on this pitch curve, which is identical in structure to the amplitude envelope we were looking at last time. In other words, there are five nodes in this thing, but you can only see three. And that's because three of them are in the same place. When we hover over this first node, you can see T3, L3. So I'm gonna need to drag that out of the way. And then we can see the second node underneath, and then I can pick that up. And finally, we get down to the first node here. So if we're going to want to play with the envelope, and as you'll see shortly, we can uh, adjust settings for each one of these nodes. You really need to make sure that you're playing with the right one, otherwise you're gonna get yourself confused. Now, although the pitch curve uh, shares many similarities with the amplitude envelope we looked at last time, it's a little bit more flexible because we can now adjust the time position of the first node. So we've still got the same number of nodes, but essentially we gain an extra one by virtue of the fact of being able to move the first node in the x-axis. Other than that, they're pretty straightforward and I'm not gonna repeat everything that I talked about in the last um, episode. Fundamentally, we've got this multi-point curve that we can draw and you can see the same kind of crosshairs idea when we hover over nodes that can only be moved in one direction. We only get that version of the crosshair and in others, we can move it both ways. The other point uh, to note between pitch and amplitude curves is that the pitch curve has a zero point and a symmetrical axis. So we can now have negative values. And here you can see level two at minus 300 nod down here. That's obviously gonna be a negative pitch. Now if I press a key on the keyboard and this is a pitch envelope, you might expect there to be some pitch variance. There isn't going to be. That's because we haven't yet dialed in any depth of this envelope. Envelope depth down here is the means by which we say how much of this thing we want to happen. So if I bring in some envelope depth, and now press a key, up and down, below zero, and then we're gonna come back up above zero, and then we're gonna eventually hold at our sustain level, which is gonna be this point but because I set this node over here at 1023, it's gonna take 30 seconds to get to this sustain level. Now this time, because we're talking about a pitch envelope and not an amplitude envelope, this envelope depth is talking about how much pitch variance is going to, going to be applied, not how much volume. So listen to the maximum extent this note goes to. Now if I give it more envelope depth, it goes higher. So this is a scalable envelope. And this is one of the reasons why Roland have given arbitrary zero to one, 1023 ranges rather than specific values because almost everything in the synthesizer can be scaled and stretched. I'm just gonna take the envelope depth back out again, control click, so that I can talk about the coarse and fine tune without um, confusing things. So we're back to a nice static tone. So this coarse tune value here, I'll set it to plus three. So that's now a minor third above the original note. If we have a look on the tuner, there's our E flat. This is a partial based coarse tuning. The coarse tuning knob in the common controls up here is applying to the entire synthesizer to all four partials simultaneously. So this is where we can basically, we could dial in four different partials, each with coarse tuning off, different coarse tuning offsets and essentially play chords every time we play a note. Random is an additional means by which we can uh, alter the tuning of the notes, but it's gonna basically choose a new value to randomize the pitch to each time we press a key. And it's in cents, which are one hundredths of a semitone. Now the random value defaults to zero, but if I crank it all the way up to the top, to 1200, that means we're gonna get a plus or minus 
12 semitone range every time I press a note. So if I press uh, C3, then if you have a look on the tuner, we're going to get anything between C2 and C4. So there's a B3, which is one of the higher notes that we could reach. There's the note right in the middle, C3. Let's wait till we get a low one. There's an A2. F2. Ultimately, eventually, if I press enough notes, it's going to find that entire range. This random control is a good opportunity for me to show you another um, shortcut. Let's say I want to set this value to 100. Well, the scale's got 1200 points in it. And picking the, um, the slider up with my mouse and trying to hit exactly 100 is going to be almost impossible. Now, we could go into Pro Edit and find the pitch random value. It's currently set to 107. And it's not going to take very long to find that value and I can type it in there. But in the visual editor, uh, if you shift and click with your mouse, then you can step up and down in single increments. And as we saw in the last episode, you've got the ability to patch in two different low frequency oscillators into the, this time we're dealing with pitch. So if I dial in some LFO1, then it's going to increase and decrease the pitch at this rate. Control click. Another thing the pitch envelope has in common with the amp envelope is that if we head into the common uh, the common page of the Pro Edit screen and turn the ADSR switch back on again, just as with the amplitude, we get a simplified pitch curve. Uh, you'll note that now the pitch can't go below zero. So one of the constraints when it's in effectively classical analog mode is that you have a pretty simple pitch curve and all of its modulation targets are positive. Okay, we're going to jump over to the Pro Edit screen very shortly, but before we do, I've just dialed in this really simple, very dramatic envelope shape. Up, all the way down, all the way back up, and then we're going to hold at the maximum pitch of, uh, modulation level just to make it really obvious what's going on as we head into the Pro Edit screen, because some of the stuff in this screen is a little bit esoteric. Let's jump over to the Pitch tab. You can see the first three values we've already dealt with. They're in the uh, Visual Edit page. Pitch key follow isn't. So the default is 100, which means for every octave I increase on the keyboard, I'm going to go up an octave in pitch. So I'll just temporarily take the envelope uh, out by setting the depth to zero. Just add a little bit of random set as well. So there's my C3 on the tuner, you can see. Play one octave higher, there's C4. If I set this to 200, now the lower note generates a C2, because we're basically pivoting around an axis here. One octave higher, it's gonna be a C4. One octave higher, we'll play a C6 and the entire thing scales between those limits. So if I set it to 50, one octave on the keyboard is gonna represent half an octave in pitch. There's C4, one octave lower, it's gonna be a G flat three, which is six semitones lower. Control click, we'll set it back to its default value of 100. Uh, you may remember in the last uh, episode, I talked about lots of different controls having uh, vibrato sensitivity. So this is the pitch envelopes example. I'll turn some vibrato up. So there's LFO1 being used as basically um, a delivery mechanism for the vibrato. If I, if I turn the pitch sensitivity up, you're going to hear much bigger pitch variance, pitch modulation. Control click, sets it back to its default of 10. And let's turn the vibrato off. Stereo detune detunes the oscillator. Basically, it splits the A and B channels up and, and sends different pitch uh, instructions to each ear. Now, at extreme levels, it doesn't sound great. But at very low levels, it can be absolutely gorgeous. I'll turn it off completely and play C major. Now I'll give it a very slight amount of detune. You hear that shimmer. You 
immediately get a much more realistic kind of electro electric piano roadsy kind of feel stereo detune can be gorgeous so as is often the case with this stuff try subtle try extreme to find out what it does kind of probably do a bit of a uh, and then run away but try subtle a lot of this stuff really works with very small amounts now we get onto the Pro Edit page envelope settings. Let's bring our envelope depth back in. So there's our up, down, and back again kind of thing. Then we've got various velocity sensitivities, which can be confusing because they're actually dealing with different metrics. The first one is um, pitch modulation depth. So when we turn up velocity sensitivity uh, here, we're going to get an, an increased pitch variance. The other ones are dealing with stretching things out in time. Let's deal with the pitch envelope first. So I'll just play a regular C. If I turn pitch sensitivity on and press a really light key, there's hardly any pitch variance there at all. Hit the key harder. Pretty straightforward what that's doing. But that's across the entire keyboard. Every key is going to respond similarly. It's just a question of how hard you hit the key determines the range of the pitch modulation. T1 velocity sensitivity relies on there being a T1 in the first place. So how long do we take uh, to travel over that first, first element of the pitch curve? So let's dial some in, play a quiet note. There's the slow progression up to the first node. Now I'll hit the same key harder. And it's much faster to get to that first point. As I said in the last episode, I don't bother with um, release key velocity sensitivity, so I'll jump over that one. I've just realized that I made a complete mess of describing uh, time key follow in my original attempt, so I'm just cutting a, a new version back in. Basically, I've just um, amended the curve slightly to make it a little bit more obvious what's going on. Time key follow is all about adjusting the speed of the pitch curve, depending on what key you've played but it ignores the first section. This is what I didn't describe very well. It ignores the first um, attack stage, the first time stage, and then takes over afterwards. So if we have a look at the visual edit page, I've got three pretty equally based up, down, up sections. If I set my time key follow to zero, you can hear it go up smoothly, back down smoothly, and then finish at its resting place. And it's the same for every pitch. Now if I turn time key follow on, set it to maximum. There's the first example. So that's the low note. Again, all of the notes are fairly equal. Now the first attack phase is still going to be the same. But the subsequent curves are going to go faster. Again, first attack phase, pretty much constant and then the rest of the envelope gets faster and faster. Okay, back to your regular scheduled program. But if you think time key follow is narrow, it's got nothing on velocity curve. So what we're talking about here is seven different curves, and here they are. So by default, it's set to curve one, which is the normal, the normal curve. But you can see curve three has a very, very low, very slow takeoff, and then gets to maximum right at the end. Just bear that in mind. Change this to velocity curve three and play some notes. That was a quiet note. And there's a loud note. There's no difference, it's not doing anything. What I need to do is introduce velocity sensitivity as a concept. So if I dial velocity sensitivity in to about 60, now play a quiet note, hardly any velocity change. It's a louder note. Now you get the, the full velocity curve being implemented over the pitch modulation. So absolutely no thank you very much. That's too much, guys. I understand that this stuff is theoretically possible, but you're just blowing my mind. <laughs> if you want to get down to that level of granularity, be my guest. You've got a bigger brain than me. LFO trigger switch will cause the entire pitch envelope to be re-triggered every time the LFO repeats an oscillation. So you can hear it drawing as much of the envelope as it can before it's re-triggered by the LFO. 
and then the rest of the settings down here are simply text-based representations of what we drew in the graph and like I said last time there's very rarely I would make any edits to the envelope over here I'll do that in the visual, visual edit screen this is just a much better environment in which to make changes like that in my opinion that's the pitched envelope covered hope you enjoyed the episode please hit the like button if you did uh, it helps me out with YouTube and stuff I'll see you for the next one thanks a lot